Hi everyone, my name is Allison Leaf and I'm a program manager at Seven Bridges managing our efforts on the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst project. I want to begin by saying that I have no financial relationships with relevant companies to disclose. During this talk, I'll provide an overview of the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst ecosystem and the hosted data sets. Then I'll share some highlights of the workspace environment that's called NHLBI Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges. So this is one of the workspaces that's within the overall Biodata Catalyst ecosystem. And then finally, I'll tell you how to join the Biodata Catalyst community and test out the ecosystem for yourself. Let's start with why Biodata Catalyst was created in the first place. Over the last 10 years, researchers have continued to improve genomic sequencing methods, making it faster and cheaper to generate genomics data. This has led to numerous data sequencing projects funded by the NIH and the creation of a wealth of large genomics data sets that can fuel research and precision medicine. However, these increasingly large data sets bring challenges to data analysis. Some universities have high performance computing infrastructure, so storing and managing these large data sets is possible. However, institutional agreements must be put in place to ensure that sensitive controlled data sets are handled appropriately. Storing and managing petabytes of data can be cumbersome, requiring resources to manage the data and ensure latest versions are available. To perform analysis, researchers must wait their turn in line, and it can take weeks to process thousands of samples when you might want the results tomorrow. For researchers who are working on collaborative projects or researchers who are part of a consortia, there aren't easy mechanisms to share results with other researchers, and this often means creating new copies of the data sets. Finally, it's important to note that many researchers are based at universities that don't have high performance computing clusters necessary for managing and analyzing these large data sets, thereby preventing them from using these resources in the first place. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute recognized these challenges and developed a cloud-based ecosystem to democratize access to data and computational power. This platform is called Biodata Catalyst, and it enables researchers to access heart, lung, blood, and sleep data sets. These data sets are stored in the cloud by NHLBI so that researchers don't have to worry about managing the data. The platform also provides tools and access to the cloud computing infrastructure of Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud, so researchers anywhere can access and analyze these data sets. Currently, there are 3.4 petabytes of data available in Biodata Catalyst. There are over 80 studies from the Transomics for Precision Medicine Initiative. The TopMed studies offer a wealth of phenotype data related to heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders. And some of these studies have thousands of phenotype variables measured. Researchers can access both the raw phenotypes that are available on dbGaP, as well as some harmonized phenotypes that were created by the TopMed Data Coordinating Center. So both of those are available on Biodata Catalyst. As for the genomic data, Biodata Catalyst currently hosts the aligned reads and variant calls. Other omics data, including metabolomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, those will be added to the system after they're released on dbGaP. This combination of rich phenotype data and genotype data makes the TopMed studies a really powerful resource for statistical genetics. And I'm going to say a little more um, later on in the presentation about some of the tools that we have available on Biodata Catalyst um, that can help you perform these kinds of analyses. If you're interested in using these data sets in your research, you'll need to work with your PI to apply for access on dbGaP. And Sweta's presentation later today is going to tell you more about how to do this. In addition to the TopMed data, the plan is for Biodata Catalyst to host COVID-19 data sets. Currently, the system hosts the ORCID data set from the PEDAL network, which provides clinical trial data on hydroxychloroquine treatment among patients. 
More studies will be released in the coming year as these studies are, are registered on dbGaP. The ecosystem also hosts a subset of BioLink data sets with clinical data from patients with sickle cell disease. These data sets are general research use and users can apply for access in dbGaP. BioLink also has some open access tutorial data sets that can be useful for working with trainees. And to further support trainees, the system hosts the 1000 Genomes data set, which is open access. If you're new to Biodata Catalyst, the 1000 Genomes data set can be really useful to work with while testing out tools in the ecosystem. So how do you find these data sets on Biodata Catalyst? Biodata Catalyst is an ecosystem of cloud-based platforms and services that are integrated with each other to provide maximum functionality to the end user. So in this diagram, you see all the different components of the ecosystem and some arrows um, between them to show how they're in interconnected at a very high level. In the hosted data layer that's shown at the bottom of the diagram here, NHLBI is storing one copy of the data on AWS and one copy on Google Cloud. And then users on any of the various platforms in Biodata Catalyst access and analyze the same copy of the data. So this is what eliminates the need to manage these large data sets locally. The hosted data layer has an authorization service that programmatically manages whether a researcher can access a particular data set reading their permissions from dbGaP. There are several search services to meet different types of data search needs. For example, using the picture search service, a researcher can search for a specific uh, phenotype variable that was measured in a top med study and form a cohort of subjects. And then the phenotype and genomic files that are associated with that cohort can be analyzed in one of the workspace environments, Seven Bridges or Terra. In one of the talks later today, Beth Sheets is gonna tell you about another user flow where the user performs a search for hosted data in the Gen3 platform, and then finds a tool um, in the doc store repository, and then brings the data and the tool into the workspace environment, um, Terra. Alternatively, the researcher could use the Seven Bridges workspace environment. So I'm going to elaborate on Seven Bridges throughout the rest of this talk. But overall, the goal here is to provide users with flexibility and choice for different platforms that will meet their analysis needs. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on what you can do in the workspace environment called NHLBI Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges. Seven Bridges provides a private, secure workspace environment for running analyses at scale. The workspaces are called projects and are used to organize files, methods, and results. Users can create as many projects as they like on the platform and add their files for analysis. To set up and perform an analysis, the user also brings their apps to the project. And apps is the term on the platform for bioinformatics tool and workflow. Apps can be configured and executed within the project. And then these analyses are called tasks. Result files from the tasks are organized in the project. So this keeps everything for your research study organized together. If you have private data that you would like to manage and analyze on Biodata Catalyst, there are several options for conveniently bringing your own data to the platform. There's a command line uploader that's best suited for large data uploads. For smaller data uploads, you can simply drag and drop files from your computer. If your data is already in an AWS or Google Cloud storage bucket, you can connect that directly to the platform and avoid moving the data. So this enables you to treat your private cloud storage as an external file repository to your projects on the platform. Once a secure connection is established, the private bucket can be treated as any other file repository and the users retain full control over access, management, and integrations. 
to enable researchers to work with data that's stored on distributed cloud locations like AWS US East One versus Google US West One, the platform lets you compute on either AWS or Google Cloud. From one user interface, the users can select whether they want to run their computation on AWS US East One or Google US West One. So let's say that you have your data in a private AWS bucket. Um, you could connect that bucket to the platform using the feature I just described, and then you could select to perform your computation on AWS and avoid any data egress charges between different cloud providers. If you plan to work with the hosted data on Biodata Catalyst, like the TopMed data, you can access those data sets according to your permissions in dbGaP. So let's say you're looking to perform an association study to identify inflammation biomarkers. You would first identify NHLBI studies of interest that have measured the phenotypic variables you're interested in. Then you'd work with your PI to apply for access to that study in dbGaP. And then once you have access to the study in dbGaP, you can access the study files on Biodata Catalyst and run analyses. This screenshot shown here shows what it looks like for a user who has access to one of the top med studies that's called Women's Health Initiative, abbreviated WHI. And they've added all the VCF files from that study to a workspace in preparation for an association test. So they've made links here to the copy of the data that NHLBI is storing um, in their cloud buckets. Uh, if you had access to four top med studies uh, that you wanna use um, in your association test for inflammation biomarkers, you could organize the files for those four different studies into folders. So you see four folders here and the option here to add a new folder. So various options for organization and management of files. What if you don't have any, what if you don't have access to any top med studies yet, but you know some variants that you're interested in, perhaps from prior association tests on other data sets like millions veteran program data or uh, UK Biobank. You can use the data overview feature of Biodata Catalyst to search for specific variants and then view aggregated results. So using this query box here, users can search for specific variants or look at a region of the genome and then see how many samples in each top med study have the variant of interest. So for example, in this query, the BioMe study has 3,923 samples that have the variant. And this green check mark here shows that I have access to the BioMe study. But if you didn't have access, then you could go to dbGaP and apply for access. This is an open access feature, and all platform users can take advantage of it. Importantly, results are not shown for GSR restricted studies in accordance with NHLBI policies. Let's talk about who can access data within a project. Platform projects can be private to data owners. So in this project shown here, you can see I'm the only individual that's listed in the member section. So any data that I upload to this project is gonna remain private and accessible only to me. But what if you need to collaborate with someone in another lab? The platform makes it really easy to work together in the same projects. Project owners can add collaborators as members. In this project, you can see there are already four members and new members can be added by selecting manage members. For each new member, you can set granular permissions on what these individuals can see and do in the project based on their role. So we're adding this new user, Sarah, and she's being given write, copy and execute privileges. So she'll be able to add files to the project and run analyses. But since she doesn't have the admin privilege that I have right here, she's not gonna be able to add new members to the project. Let's shift from data to tools. Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges 
offers users a curated collection of over 500 bioinformatics tools and workflows that have been optimized for speed and cost in the cloud by the Seven Bridges Bioinformatics team. These tools are fully parameterized and customizable, and they can be run from either the user interface or the API. You can learn more about the available tools by clicking on the tool card shown here, and you can read through the tool description and helpful hints for running the tool. To support researchers who are performing statistical genetics analyses, Biodata Callus hosts many popular statistical genetics tools that are ready to run and optimized for the cloud. So for example, a researcher could search GWAS here and then see all the tools and workflows that can be used in association testing, such as Regini, Plink, Genesis, in addition to QC pipelines and tools for creating kinship and ancestry files. All of the available tools and workflows on the platform use a combination of Docker and the common workflow language to enable portability, reproducibility, and scalability. The common workflow language is a community standard workflow description language that describes all of the requirements for a tool to run in a reproducible manner. The platform features a web editor, so you can use this interactive interface that's shown here to combine individual CWL tools into longer workflows. You can also port in CWL workflows from external public repositories like DocStore. And then finally, you can create your own tools using our CWL tool editor. While you are welcome to learn the syntax of CWL if you're interested, the platform makes it so that you don't have to do this. With the software development kit, you can easily create tools and chain them together into workflows without any programming experience. So the SDK is going to create the CWL code for you. As a user, you would bring in your script, upload it to the tool editor, bring in a Docker image for the tool, and then add a CWL wrapper around it using the SDK. And then you'd have your tool ready to run on the platform. When running CWL tools and workflows on the platform, you can scale up to running hundreds and thousands of analyses or tasks in parallel using a feature that's called batching. In batching, there's one input file per task, and you can batch by file or file metadata. In this way, you can run the same analysis on multiple input files. A great use case for batching is running alignment and variant calling on thousands of samples batched by sample, so you can kick them off all at once. Researchers are already taking advantage of the power of the cloud to speed their research. Professor Zaychen Chong from the University of Alabama, Birmingham is a great example. Dr. Chong characterized structural variants from two top med studies. So first he got access to those two studies on Biodata Catalyst. He created CWL tools from his software packages. And then he performed variant calling on almost 3000 samples in one day. This would have taken weeks on his local cluster. Many users on Biodata Catalyst need to perform phenotype harmonization, and other users are looking to do fast prototyping of custom tertiary analysis tools using interactive Java, Python, and R. For these users, the platform offers access to JupyterLab Notebooks, RStudio, and SAS Studio. Users can go to the Data Cruncher feature, which is shown in the screenshot, and then select to launch either the Jupyter Lab Notebook environment, RStudio, or SAS Studio. All the files in your project are available within the notebooks with over 50 instance types to select from. With the ongoing proliferation of genomic sequencing data, the number of rare variants found is growing rapidly. And to detect associations between phenotypes of interest and these rare variants, researchers employ mechanisms to increase statistical power in association testing. 
Variant annotation information can be used to combine variants into biologically relevant units of inference, which can then be used in an association test. Although these methods are currently available, working with a massive volume of variants and annotation data has been a major logistical and technical obstacle for researchers. So Seven Bridges teamed up with the TopMed Data Coordinating Center to create the Annotation Explorer feature on Biodata Catalyst, which enables users to interactively explore aggregation and filtering strategies for variants based on their annotations. And you can create files that you would use in the association test. This feature can be used post-association testing to explore annotations for a specific set of variants. The users can select from uh, different databases. The first one is a genome-wide database that has 8.8 .8 billion single nucleotide variants uh, with over 700 annotations per variant. This database is open access and it's available to all researchers on Biodata Catalyst. This is huge. Um, and then there's a separate database for uh, 500 and 40 million single nucleotide variants from TopMed Freeze 8. And in order to access um, this database, users need to have access to at least one TopMed study. Querying mil millions of uh, variant annotations, it takes minutes on the Annotation Explorer. And this is compared to hours on uh, previous existing technology. So this is a really exciting resource on Biodata Catalyst. Users incur two types of cloud costs on Biodata Catalyst, computation costs for analyses and storage costs for uploaded data and derived results. Computation costs depend on the instance size and the duration for which it is used. Storage costs depend on the size of your data and the duration the data is stored on the platform. All your cloud costs on Seven Bridges are captured in what's called a platform billing group. And that's what the screenshot is showing here. Um, so this is an example billing group where you can see a breakdown of the analysis costs and the storage costs, current usage, and your payment method. Um, so the costs in the billing group can be paid for with either cloud credits or you can be billed monthly um, for the cloud costs that you incur. If you're new to computing in the cloud, you may be wondering how much does this cost? So let's say you upload five terabytes of data to AWS S3 buckets on the platform. The cloud costs are passed directly through to the user from the cloud provider. There's no markup for using Biodata Catalyst. But this means that you can use the AWS pricing model to estimate your cloud costs. While the AWS pricing fluctuates, let's use $0.021 per gigabyte per month for a storage estimate. So if you multiply that by 5,000 gigabytes, you get $105. So your monthly storage cost would be about $105. What about running an analysis like um, the Genesis Association test on 10,000 files? So once again, the cloud costs for computation are passed through the user with no markup. So you can look at the prices of AWS and Google instances to estimate your costs. So if you're using the AWS R5, uh, .12 X large instance that provides one CPU and eight RAM. It's going to take about one hour um, for the pipeline to run on the 10,000 files, and the cost is um, about $17. It's really helpful to estimate your cloud costs in advance of performing large analyses. The CWL tools and workflows that are available on Biodata Catalyst. Um, they all have benchmarking information available that can be really useful for coming up with this estimate. So for example, what's shown here is some really extensive benchmarking uh, that was done on the Genesis Association pipelines. 
And you can see that a range of samples were tested. We have 10,000 samples, 36,000 samples, um, up to 50,000 samples. And then in the benchmarking table, um, the instance type is indicated, the number of CPUs and RAMs, in addition to how long did it take for the workflow to run, and then what was the cost. If you need help um, while you're working on the system, you can always contact our support team by um, clicking this question mark that's in the lower right hand corner of the platform. And a little box pops up where you can type your message um, and ask questions about failed analyses, login issues, or any other question you have about the system. If you like what you saw in this presentation and you'd like to try things out for yourself, the first step is to join the Biodata Catalyst community. Amber's presentation later today is going to go through the steps of how to join the community. Essentially, joining the community gives you access to the overall ecosystem help desk and forums, and you'll hear about opportunities for training sessions, webinars, and new resources um, within Biodata Catalyst. And then to test out Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges, your next step after joining the community would be to create an account on this specific platform. You'll use your ERA Commons ID to create your account. So if you don't have one yet, you can ask your PI who to contact. NHLBI generously offers $500 in free pilot cloud credits for you to test the system. So your next step would be to apply for these credits. And then as you get started on the platform, we recommend running some simple analyses to start. Um, you could work with the open access 1000 genomes data and try uh, running a few CWL pipelines that are available on the system. Um, there are tutorials available to help guide you through um, how to do this. Thanks for your time today. I'd like to acknowledge NHLBI for funding this really exciting project and platform that we hope will make a huge difference um, and impact on your research. The Seven Bridges team, especially PI Brandy Davis-Dusenberry and Program Director Jack D. Giovanna, and finally the Biodata Catalyst consortium members who make this a really awesome community to be a part of. Thanks.